Okay, welcome to chapter 17, the final chapter of the semester. Uh, there are three big topics we'd like to discuss in terms of multinational financial management. The first big topic is currencies and exchange rates. Uh, to give you an idea of the full measure of the different currencies floating around in circulation in different countries, I've got a link here that'll take you to a site that should show you all the different currencies that were in circulation back in 2008 is the most recent time this was updated, but it shows beginning in Afghanistan, there's an Afghan, Afghani, all the way down through Z, there's a Zimbabwean dollar. And so alphabetically speaking, there's multiple different currencies that different countries use as their primary medium of exchange. Not everyone uses a U.S. dollar. In fact, there's all kinds of different dollars floating around in the world. Not all of them are U.S. dollars. The second idea that I wanted to just show you a web link for is this exchange rate link. And so if we go to that exchange rate link, that'll take us here, which we can do a lot of different things at this site. Uh, we could look up historical exchange rates. The one thing I want to pay particular attention to is click on this rates table. And this isn't as comprehensive as the full list of currencies in the world, but this will give you an actual up-to-date exchange rate for many different currencies that are traded, exchanged for US dollars on a frequent basis. So just to give you an idea that this column here, this inverse dollar, that's what we will call a direct quote. This column here, one US dollar, that's what we would call an indirect quote. This indirect quote is the price of one dollar in terms of the foreign currency. So for example, it takes 0.94 euros to buy one dollar. It takes 68 Indian rupees to buy a dollar. It takes 110 Japanese yen to buy a dollar. Conversely, the second column, this inverse dollars, is how many dollars does it take to buy the foreign currency? It takes one dollar and six cents, we'll say, to buy one euro. A dollar twenty-three to buy a pound. It takes seventy cents to buy a Singapore dollar, and so forth. So this is actually one of the bigger points of confusion. This exact same exchange rate, euros for dollars or dollars for euros, can be expressed two different ways. And so depending on which way you express it, you get a slightly different number. And so that's the biggest point of confusion as it relates to exchange rates. Are we talking about a direct quote or an indirect quote? Are we talking about the exchange rate being 1.059 or 0.944? It's the exact same exchange rate, it's just whether we're talking about one dollar or one unit of foreign currency. Okay, let's see if we can help clarify that a little bit with our notes. Okay, so, oh my goodness, here we go. Direct quote, that is the price of one unit of foreign currency in terms of U.S. dollars. That's that inverse one U.S. dollar column in the exchange rate website. And I've highlighted this because this is, we'll use this terminology from time to time when I ask questions or also when we express the other two big concepts from Multinational Financial Management, Chapter 17. In any case, when we're talking about a direct quote, we're gonna symbolize that as dollars per unit of foreign currency. So dollar slash F, where F represents foreign currencies. So here in an example, if we were talking about dollars per euros, that dollar slash F maybe expresses dollar slash euro. In any case, $1.12 is equivalent to one euro. So in order to buy one unit of foreign currency, to buy one euro, it takes $1.12. A different exchange rate, what about the dollar, how many units of a dollar would it take to buy a yen? Now in this case, you might get 0 0.008 is one yen. So the dollar to yen exchange rate is 0 0.008. These are direct quotes. We could also express those same things in terms of an indirect quote, that is, how, what's the price of one dollar in terms of the foreign currency? This is that one U.S. dollar column from the exchange rate website, that first column. We will express that with the foreign currency on top slash dollar. So how many units of the foreign currency does it take to buy one dollar? I'm going to try to scroll down a little bit here. So let me keep the title. There we go. Um, so 0.8929 euros is one dollar. So the foreign to dollar exchange rate, the euro to dollar exchange rate, an indirect quote is 0.8929. Now it might be 125 Japanese yen is equivalent to a dollar. So the foreign to dollar exchange rate, the yen to dollar exchange rate is 125. Now I think I've set up these numbers such that this 125 yen to dollar exchange rate is equivalent to this 
0.008 dollar to yen exchange rate and similarly with the euro although you might want to double check that in fact let's double check that while we're thinking of it let's just verify that if I were to take the inverse take one, one divided divide by one, one point, point one, one, one two, two equal. equal there you go so I am using the same number so that's at least designed to give you at least some idea that yeah the same exchange rate one dollar and twelve cents is one euro or 0.8929 euros is one dollar that's the same thing it's whether we express that as a direct quote or an indirect quote okay there are a couple problems that will hopefully help improve your ability to calculate exchange rates um, problems one and two the solutions to problem one and two are at the end of the notes and we won't necessarily talk your way through those in detail they are provided in the notes though problems one and two relate to direct quotes or indirect quotes okay within the same topic of currencies and exchange rate there's a couple few more terms we need to be aware of spot exchange rate forward exchange rate spot exchange rate is the exchange rate for delivery today like the spot market I think we talked about this way back in like chapter one or maybe it was two um, the spot market is for delivery today what the exchange rate is right now now in a lot of business cases you might say well I know that I, I need to buy automobiles from a foreign country three months from now in order to ship them into our country uh, but I don't need that I don't need those that foreign currency units until three months from now but what I would like to do is lock in that exchange rate today so I might enact a forward contract to lock in the exchange rate today so I don't have to worry about the exchange rate of the foreign currency per US dollar to change over time and so when we're talking about those rates in the future we're talking about forward exchange rates so that is the exchange rate it's still the exchange rate whether it be dollars per foreign unit currency or foreign unit currency per dollar we're talking about just locking that in for exchange at some point in the future so that's the forward exchange rate okay because what does happen is exchange rates change and if exchange rates change such that a currency will buy more of another currency the currency that will buy more is appreciating whereas if a currency buys less of the foreign currency that currency is depreciating here's an example suppose before suppose before before an event happens suppose the dollar to yen is 0 0.008 or the yen to dollar is a dollar 25 those are it's the same suppose something happens and now now the exchange rates are different now the dollar to yen is 0 0.01 and the yen to dollar is a hundred now in this case this one US dollar buys less yen it used to be one US dollar bought 125 yen now it's the case that one dollar only buys 100 yen so one dollar buys fewer yen so the dollar is depreciating or we could look at it one yen now buys more it used to be the case that one yen only bought 0 0.008 dollars not even a full penny now in the after scenario the yen buys a full penny it buys 0 0.01 dollars so in that sense the yen is appreciating it will always be the case that if the dollar is depreciating the yen will be appreciating or vice versa um, however that's not necessarily the case that if the dollar is appreciating or depreciating relative to the yen that will apply to other currencies each exchange rate has its own sort of relationship but each exchange rate can be expressed two different ways question two will help finalize your measurement of this idea of appreciation depreciation spot and forward rates we're actually going to use this spot and forward rates again here in just a little bit so as we flip the page to page two of our notes here's the second big topic second big topic both of these second and third topics are sort of economic identities that we want to be aware of the first being interest rate parity According to interest rate parities, investors should earn the same return in all countries after adjusting for risk. So if two countries are equally risky, you should earn the same rate of return in each country regardless of where you make your investment. Now for that to be true, the ratio of the forward exchange rate to the spot exchange rate should equal the ratio of one plus the domestic interest rate divided by one plus the foreign interest rate. And when we're talking about exchange rates, we're talking about the direct quote format for the exchange rate. So that's why I highlighted these two. These are the direct quotes. So the forward direct quote divided by the spot direct quote 
should be the ratio of one plus the home currency to one plus the foreign currency interest rate. For our purposes, we'll always consider the U.S. as the home currency. So just to avoid confusion in terms of where to plug numbers in where, I just assume the U.S. would go in the numerator here, the foreign currency would go in the denominator, one plus the foreign interest rate, and then the exchange rate would be expressed in direct quote format. Okay, questions five and three. Well, question five, problem three, will test that idea of interest rate parity. The last big topic of chapter 17 that we're going to concern ourselves with is this idea of purchasing power parity. Sometimes it's referred to as the law of one price. The idea is that the same product should cost the same in different countries. And that makes sense. Um, there is a big assumption that you need to make for that to be true. Uh, it assumes there's no transportation costs, no transactions costs. So what that would mean in effect is if I could buy a compact disc with 10 songs on it, those same 10 songs should cost the same in the U.S. as they would in Mexico. If it weren't the case, you could conduct arbitrage. Like if, say, the disc were really cheap in Mexico, well, then I could just buy a bunch in Mexico, bring them to the U.S. and sell them at a price and drive the price in Mexico up, the price in the U.S. down. And that arbitrage would, in effect, create purchasing power parity. The price should be the same. Now, I say that assumes no transportation costs. Because, well, with a physical commodity, like a compact disc, I actually have to go to Mexico, buy it, and then bring it back. So that's actually going to be costly. So when we observe the prices of compact discs, we may see some slight discrepancies in one country or another. But that's primarily due to transportation costs. The second thing is it may not be the identical product. Maybe it's a slightly different product. It might be jeans, say, might be slightly different cut or slightly different stitching or something like that. And so there might be different prices, but they're not identical. That's another reason why purchasing power parity doesn't necessarily hold with exact certainty. One last comment there. Uh, you would think about, when, remember when we talk about financial instruments versus physical or tangible assets. Um, when tangible items are traded, you can expect some differences in purchasing power parity. With financial assets, those should trade almost identically. You would imagine that a 10-year certificate of deposit at 4% traded in the U.S. should be the exact same price in another country adjusting for the exchange rate because those assets trade electronically. You don't have to actually go. You just click your mouse and get the addition or subtraction to an account. So financial assets that are traded electronically should adhere much more closely to the law of one price or purchasing power parity. Specifically, what that is, is you could say, well, the price in the home country should equal the foreign price multiplied by the spot exchange rate. A different way of expressing that is, is that the spot exchange rate should equal the ratio of the price in the home country divided by the price in the foreign country. To use some of our other terminology, we could say, when we mean spot exchange rate, we could plug in the direct quote exchange rate times the foreign price should equal the domestic price. Or you could think of a, the direct quote should equal the ratio of prices, home to foreign. And so we're going to use direct quote notation here should equal the ratio with the home on the top, foreign on the bottom. And again, we'll assume the home country is U.S. and the foreign country is whatever other country we're comparing to. There are two well, I guess there's one question, one problem that'll relate to the idea of purchasing power parity. Those are the three concepts we want to be familiar with in Chapter 17. Currencies and exchange rates. And then also we need to be able to, there's sort of subcontext there. Well, is that a direct quote or indirect quote? Is the currency appreciating, depreciating? Is it a spot exchange rate or a future exchange rate? So that's one big concept. The second big concept is uh, interest rate parity. And then lastly, purchasing power parity. Okay, there are a few additional problems and questions that we haven't specifically mentioned. Those solutions are also below, so I would encourage you to work through the questions and problems and then check your answers with the information provided below. Hope you've enjoyed Chapter 17 as well as the rest of the semester and are able to pull off a high score on your final exam. Good luck.